Are you bored living a mediocre life? We were too, and we know how to change that. Each week, we'll leave our comfort zones to explore a new topic, then step onto our soapboxes, a safe space to sound off on our latest adventure. Come explore with us. All opinions are welcome. This is a mindset. This is a lifestyle. This is Siren Soapbox. Hello and welcome, fellow explorers. Thank you for diving in with us today. Our mission is to explore beyond comfort zones. Looking to take the first step outside of your comfort zone? Check out sirensoapbox.com for easy ideas you can explore with our blog, magazine, and Eventbrite classes. If you've been with us for a while, you know we talk about synchronicities a lot. We try to explore outside the boundaries of our comfort zones, and part of that includes talking to people from all walks of life. And yet, there are many times that serendipitously, our guest views have a common thread, or sometimes even threads, with ours. And when that happens, it can only be described as living in tune, which is, in fact, the title of the book we read for today's episode, Living in Tune, 21 Questions to Activate Your Intuition and Find Your Life Purpose, by Liz Roberta. Some of these synchronicities include getting rid of that gosh dang word should that we keep talking about all the time, vision boards, minimalism, following your North Star, mindfulness in the moment, getting into nature, defining your why, and repeating numbers. And that's just to name a few. In the book, Liz writes, your soul is calling you quietly towards the place where it will feel at peace. So it is your job to tune in and listen to what it has to say. This can be scary, but you'll know you're ready to take the leap. And when you do, the universe will be waiting. Remember that you're multifaceted and try not to narrow your vision of what your purpose should be, as you may find it in a few different areas that somehow weave into one another. Once you know what you're here for, you can finally make your mark on the world and enjoy the feeling of living in tune. Let's find out what the sirens need to fine tune or if they're living in tune. But first, if at any time the conversation gets too intense, the safe word is... Mango. Mango. First up on our soapbox is myrrh. You know that feeling you get in your stomach when something doesn't feel right, or that spark you feel when something feels perfect? That is your gut talking to you, and it is real. Your physical body reacts to your intangible feelings as a way to sort of guide your decisions. And Liz Roberta talks a lot about this in her book, Living in Tune. My gut instinct is very strong and it always tells me the truth. Although I don't always listen to it, I'm afraid. Um, Liz's book though is a great tool for checking in with yourself and making sure you're on the right path. There were so many synchronicities between this book and our podcast, like Elsie mentioned. Um, Liz talks about purging, both letting go of limiting beliefs and physical possessions that aren't fueling your soul. She talks about being grateful for the things we have as a way of shifting our perspective. She talks about that feeling you get when something you're doing lights you up inside. And all of these things are things that we visited on the show before, but I think what Liz does in her book is package up all of those things into one bundle that will help guide someone looking for their life's purpose. And it's all in one place. And we found this book at a time in my life when I didn't really feel lost. But what this book did for me is help solidify that I'm doing the things I love to do and the things that I'm really good at on a regular basis. Recording this podcast (laughs) lights me up inside. Working with a voice coach makes me feel nerve sighted in the best possible way. So what I've learned is that sometimes a tool like this comes along to help a person get out of a rut and onto a path of positive momentum. And sometimes a tool like this comes along to remind us that we're already on the right path and that we should keep up the good work. And the latter is the case for me. And I'm pretty grateful to have read it at this point in my life. I'll definitely be pulling it out to revisit the journal prompts though and read some of the great advice when I'm floundering again. Sara, what did you like about this book? Well, I'm happy to say I've read the whole Living in Tune book, and I really like how Liz takes you through each chapter or topic by suggesting journaling questions to get you thinking about how that topic relates to you. While I have answered some of these questions, I definitely want to take more time to dive deeper into some of them. I know I haven't taken enough time on them all, but I wanted to finish the book. I downloaded the workbook that Liz has available, which was very helpful, 
but I also made my own. Yep, I even painted the cover with my new watercolor talents. I'd say that I've definitely struggled with my path at times. Career-wise, I have been pretty lucky. I always knew I'd be in medicine somehow. While part of that decision certainly came from my love of animals, I did think about being a vet. The decision to become a doctor was possibly partly driven by my mom. She was a nurse and I remember from a young age, her telling me that I had to be the doctor so that I could make all the decisions. It seemed reasonable. So from a young age, I knew what I was going to do. There were some clues along the way that this was right for me. Some were the exclusionary ones, like not being creative, I used to say I was as creative as a brick, but mostly that was because of my lack of success and joy in art class. And also not being very financially savvy. My econ classes were always a struggle. However, all of my science classes were a breeze and I loved them. So medicine, intuitively, it seems, made sense. It didn't hurt that every time I played the board game life, I'd silently-ish fume if I didn't land the doctor as my career path. I do feel that this was the right direction for me as I have loved my chosen field, but I definitely agree with Liz's chapter about prosperity and the soul suffering that we can put ourselves through like I did for money. While I liked my job and the people I worked with, it literally hit me one day about five years ago that I no longer wanted to have a career that took me from home and family at all hours of any day. Within about six months of listening to that intuition, I had created my current position with my group and I no longer take call. And the peace I have felt since then is priceless. Another chapter in the book that I connected with is the one on perspective. We've talked about gratitude here before, and I agree that routinely thinking about all that you're grateful for can improve your mood. That part of the journaling is really my favorite. I've definitely struggled with the relationships in the past, and I completely believe that being in tune and listening to your intuition can lead you in the right direction. I'm thankful every day to be in an amazing relationship with the love of my life. And I just knew that I had to say hello to Bill that day. The you have all the money questions Liz asks, I think are gonna definitely help Bill and I think about what we really want to do when we retire, even if we don't have all the money. Jess, what did you like about the book? Well, I really liked how this book paralleled with a lot of what we're doing. There were some differences and things I learned going through it, however. Learning to listen to myself and my needs is something I've been working on since I put it on my vision board. As an empath, it's really hard to shut off caring for everyone around me and focusing on myself instead of everyone else. Doing the list of priorities activity was really hard, but I think I learned the most about myself from this one. Focusing on what my mind and body were telling me they needed to prioritize and not what society and my expectations for myself wanted was really interesting. I found some of the questions hard to answer, so I may need to go back and answer them again after practicing listening to myself some more, like the other sirens have said so far. I spent Saturday trying to just listen to myself and my needs since I wasn't working and I didn't have things that I needed to do and could get in trouble for not doing at work. <laughs> I found it rejuvenating. I took my time on the in the morning, drinking my coffee on the lanai and listening to the birds, singing birds, not these chickens, <laughs> and just being lazy for most of the day. It was interesting because I didn't force myself to look at the to-do list or check things off. Sunday I woke up and I found I was much more productive and from the get-go, I started to go to my to-do list and I got a lot of things knocked off. I think I have my Saturday intuition to thank for that. Overall, listening to myself is hard, but I really wanna to try to do it some more. So Elsie, did you listen to your intuition? I've always felt that I have a pretty strong intuition and I listen to it pretty closely. I'm no stranger to people criticizing me that I'm not doing life in the right order. I can't explain to you why I do the things that I do. It's just like an internal foot to the ground, anchoring to an idea that this is what I have to do. Like getting married before finishing college or insisting that I get pregnant before my husband left for war or putting a part-time job status in at work right before the shutdown and finally giving myself that time to listen to my inner voice saying, don't go back to work. I think the work one was one of the hardest. It was an incredibly difficult time in my life. Reading the book was a great comfort for me because it helped me to understand the reason for why I was feeling the things that I was feeling. For years, my insides felt raw as if they were cut a thousand times by glass. 
No matter what I did or how hard I worked, it never got better. I thought if I just push through and try harder, hustle more, this job will have that angelic moment where I finally feel fulfilled. I mean, that's what I put a decade and a half of my life into and sacrifice time and families to be with is for this career. But letting go was the hardest and most rewarding thing I've ever done for myself. Looking back today, my soul feels at peace, just like Liz describes in the book. I have a picture on my computer with my why for the podcast. It has quotes from some of my favorite people we've interviewed telling us that what we're doing is important and we need to keep going. Even the one by Paul Boynton that says, don't throw in the towel on this, which is what I was reminded of when reading that section of the book and living in tune. After meditating on the 21 questions, I feel I'm headed in the right direction that I need to be in. I'm slowly but surely getting things off the ground with my drone business, watercolor portraits, and I always feel energized by each and every recording that we do. My P that I need to work on for sure is patience. TC, did you connect with the book? Well, this book came along at a very good time for me. I'm making a lot of the same kinds of decisions that Elsie just talked about. And it's also a time that I was feeling very out of tune with myself and my career. It, so it was a great tune in and tune up for me. And as I head off in a new direction career-wise, my work staying in tune with myself will continue. I see this book as a continuing process for me. In fact, I'm really looking forward to digging in deeper with the book, recognizing my own power and all of the benefits that come with that process. It's an important work. And if everyone would take the time to do this, imagine the collective power that could be unleashed. In fact, that goes hand in hand with my answer to question three. If everyone would focus on understanding and growing their strengths and working in the area of their passions, the world would be much better off. Some of the questions were really challenging for me to answer. The writing helped at times, but I feel like I still have some digging and soul searching to do. I love that the questions lead you to focus inward with the outside world still in consideration. I love the idea of looking at what you have to offer the world rather than asking first what the world needs. It was an interesting perspective to dive inward and find solutions for the world. My favorite quote in the book, you have to leave the city of your comfort and go into the wilderness of your intuition. What you'll discover will be wonderful. What you'll discover will be yourself. And that's from Alan Alda. So the book really helped with some introspection that I needed right now, but I definitely, and it sounds unanimous among the sirens, need to continue with that introspection. Liz Roberta is a Hay House author, an award-winning spiritual coach who was named the Emerging Voice of 2020 by Kindred Spirit Magazine, one of the five most influential female coaches of 2021 by Entrepreneur Mogul, and one of the 50 under 50 for 2022 by the NYC Journal. Her Millennial Manifestor blog has been read by hundreds of thousands of people worldwide, and she's done over 5,000 card readings for clients over her career. Her Spiritual Success podcast is in the top 5% of podcasts worldwide, and her book, Living in Tune is one of the industry-leading books on intuition. Sirens, help me welcome Liz Roberta to this episode of Siren Soapbox. Hey, welcome. Welcome. <laughs> welcome to the show, Liz. Thank you so much. My God, I was not prepared for that. I literally welled up having so many people say such nice things about it. I'm really sensitive to the book. It's probably not a good thing, but it's like really... Yeah, really close to my heart. So when people say nice things about it, like it really gets me. Well, you definitely had lots to listen to between the five yeah. of us. So <laughs> I loved it. I loved everyone it. Everyone really connected to the book. And it sounds like unanimously, we're all going to continue that work, which is really cool. Um, Liz, I'm guessing there were several iterations of the questions that you asked in your book, those 21 questions. And we're curious how you knew when you landed on the right version for each of them. Yeah, this is such a great question, because as you said, of course, there are multiple iterations. When you publish a book with a publisher, 
you actually have multiple editors. So I'd be like, right, we've got them. And then I, I thought I had them. Then I go through the first editor and then I was like, they changed a little bit. Right, we've got them. Goes to the next editor. They, and it was like, continue. And you're like, oh my God, come on. So it's like constantly changing them because like one person would get how it was worded then the other person would think it could be better. And what also happened as well was I'd written the main 21 questions. And then during the editing process, my editor was like, can we add three questions at the end of every chapter? I was like, are you freaking kidding me? I've already written 21 different questions. And then I had to write three more for the end of every chapter. So it ended up being 84 different questions. And it made me laugh because in one of the Amazon reviews, this woman had wrote, oh, you know, some of the questions are a bit repetitive or something. And I was like, have you tried writing 84 different questions? <laughs> <laughs> there was so many, honestly. Um, so yeah, it was a, a big, big process. And actually what Hay House loved about it was the framework. And the reason I put the questions together was working with coaching clients and wanting to give them some kind of practical tool that they could use to help them understand themselves better because so many people had a strong sense of purpose but didn't quite know how to tune into it how to find it so I really wanted to create something practical like if you know about astrology my chart is like earthy af so like I'm not up for just you know ideas or concepts for the sake of it like I want some kind of practical application so that was what drove the the framework and the questions and I don't think it's going to be any surprise to anyone that the way I knew when the questions were right were because intuitively I just knew like it's the same with the whole of the book writing if something just didn't sit completely 100% right if I didn't feel totally satisfied even if I didn't know what it was meant to be instead I knew at some point it would change and then by the end of the process which is like a nine-month editing process every line word sentence question that I hadn't felt entirely satisfied about had at some point changed to something better where I did eventually feel totally satisfied um so yeah it was an iterative process at the time I was living in Glastonbury in England which used to be like the ancient lands of Avalon it's a very spiritual place very kind of mystical place and I was living there at the time it's also called the heart chakra of the earth by some people and it was just a whole weekend that I was there and I just wrote out these 21 questions and the questions came first before then dividing them up into concepts. Um, someone asked me where all the P words come from and I was like, I can't actually remember. I think I was just like purpose starts with P. I'm going to make them all start with P. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> But that was funny as well, because Hay House were like, we really like this. I was like, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> like, I, did, I don't know where it came from. Um, but yeah, no, I'm glad. I'm glad it all worked out because it honestly took a really long time to put them all together. But I am totally satisfied with them now and people are having success. So that's good. Really funny that you bring up the, the P questions, because that was one of the questions we had for you too. Um, it was a great, great theme I love that and something yeah that we're learning as we're going through the podcast is that we'll have topics that we want to explore and for whatever reason it falls through and then almost immediately something better falls in our laps and we're like wow that was why that happened and we need to quit forcing things in one direction and just let it happen as it happens and starting to like reading the book, I really am noticing how to start connecting with that intuition better. Totally. I truly, truly believe that everything works out for the best somehow. And like I said, with the book, I kind of had that experience of like, this word isn't right, uh, but I don't know what it's meant to be instead. And then eventually I'd be like, oh, okay, no, like this is better or you know, I'd hear a word or I'd hear a sentence or something like that. And then I'd, I'd realize why it didn't feel right. And I was like, oh, it wasn't meant to come through at that time. I needed to have a certain experience for the right word to come through at a later point in time. So it all worked out in the end. So that reminds me of being patient because it's, <laughs> it seems like you have to be very patient to go through this editing process. Mm -hmm. But I love that you mentioned um, that while it's very important to be patient and kind of wait to, you know, hear whatever you need to hear, 
whatever. But it's also important to notice the things that you're not willing to wait for. I thought that was a really interesting idea because it makes you sort of sit back and distinguish between, well, what am I really not willing to wait for? And what am I truly just being impatient about? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Because I think sometimes you aren't meant to be where you are right now. And sometimes you're settling and that's when it's like, no, no, come on, it's time to move. (laughs) And then other times it's also just not the time for it yet. So sometimes you do have to be patient. Sometimes you don't, and no one can tell you which one is right or not. It really is all up to you. And I think the whole reason I wrote this book is essentially empowerment. I want everyone to understand their own power as individuals to make their own life choices. And I think the best way to do that is with your own intuition, because that's how you're going to have the most satisfying results for you, regardless of what anyone else thinks, what anyone else thinks you should or shouldn't do. I'm glad you brought that up. I was going to ask if, do you ever use your own intuition to help guide a client or do you just give them the tools that they need because they know what's best for them? Yeah, that's a good question. And my work's changed a lot. So as you said at the beginning, I have done loads of readings. I started doing tarot readings um, and I used to do angel card readings. So I would always be giving people readings. And when I worked with clients, I'd do readings with them. And then eventually what started happening was I moved away from the tarot and instead I'd get clients to tune into their body. I'd like take them into a meditation and I'd ask them questions and get them to answer so they could give their own answers. Whereas before it would be me being like, "Mm, I think you should do this, this, this. So it totally changed my style of work and my style of work became about asking questions. So that's why I did the framework of the questions and wrote a book about asking questions. So it's totally changed. And yeah, just really trying to hold people in their own power. And I, readings can be an amazing tool. I still love a reading every once in a while, but always take it with a pinch of salt, never take it as a given. I think their greatest power comes from just confirming what you've already felt yourself, but maybe not been fully behind yet. It can be nice confirmation of, oh, yeah, okay, I felt that. When you get that confirmation from someone else, it can be really powerful. But yeah, no, you're totally right. It changed my style of working as I started holding people more in their power and understanding the value and intuition. So, do you have any clients where they, are kind of resistant to some of these ideas and maybe they've left and then they start listening to their intuition. They come back to you and they're like, Oh my gosh, you were, you were so right. Thank you for guiding me in this way. I would have never seen it without your help. Um, I've never had anyone resistant in that way. No, I think I've always been super blessed. Like when people want to work with me, they're like, they do it because of their intuition and they're like, yes, like, I really feel like this is right. So um, no, I've never had that. And to be fair, all the people I work with are spiritual entrepreneurs of some kind anyway. So everyone's already well into kind of intuitive work and energy work and things like that. Do you ever find the need to pick up your own book and go through some of these questions and sort of tune up your own intuition? Or are you so in tune that you're pretty much keep it that way? That's a good question. I don't go through and answer the questions. What I do sometimes is I'll just kind of flick it open on one page, kind of like a, an oracle, I guess. I'll flick it open. I'll be like, hmm, what are we landing on today? Because it covers so many different topics. I'll see what it lands on. I don't go through the journaling questions, but I do like to just flick and then it will often land on something that I need to see that day. So I use the book in that way. But I mean, like everyone else, I'm still not perfectly in tune all the time. We still, you know, are learning. We're still human. I'm pretty good, definitely. And I always regret it if I don't follow it. Always. And I kick myself. (laughs) It's so frustrating. Um, It definitely gets more kind of uh, like nuanced, I suppose. So like back in the day, it was big ways that I'd ignore my intuition. Now it's like teeny tiny little ways. And then I'll, I'll kick myself for that. But um, yeah, still, still a journey. I think there's always times when we're going to ignore that little niggle because it's inconvenient. Sometimes it's so inconvenient. 
So you really try and push and go another way. And uh, yeah, and then it, it doesn't work out usually. Yeah, it's crazy how that happens. And every time you ignore your intuition, at least for me, I'll promise myself, I am really going to follow my intuition from now on because it's always right. But somehow, some way, there's, there's still those little things that crop up and I go the other direction. I'm like, oh, I do it. Every <laughs> time. I love, yeah. I love the idea of just like opening the book and just letting it fall open to wherever you might be needing you know like just letting the universe tell you what you need to focus on kindle needs a random page option yeah. i know it's those thing and i read it on the kindle and i was like oh i want to do that but i don't think i can maybe i'll print you the workbook and a number generator <gasps> yeah brilliant there you go <laughs> problem solved see lc this is why we keep you around <laughs> Thanks. So Liz, number generators. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Liz, what does it feel like to be living out of tune? Are you allowed to swear on this podcast? Yeah, oh yeah, we oh, have yeah. an explicit rating. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking terrible. Awful. <laughs> it can make you ill. So as I briefly mentioned at the beginning of the book, I had generalized anxiety disorder for three years. And at the time, I didn't know that's what it was. So I was working in investment banking and I was going to the doctor with all of these physical complaints. So my heart was hurting, terrible headaches, like crippling headaches. So I was thinking it was something physical. So we thought it might be my thyroid. We did blood tests. I wore an ECG for a day and it was checked by a heart consultant at the hospital, like checking for all these physical things. And then eventually we realized I had generalized anxiety disorder. So I was ill like literally ill because I was out of tune it was awful I couldn't sleep I was sweating like my body was an oven that's why we thought it might be thyroid but actually what I'd done is I'd given myself a mental health disorder because I was so incredibly out of tune and then that was manifesting physical symptoms as well and when I changed career then that all kind of went away because it was literally a manifestation of my body, my mind, my soul being like, what are you doing? What are you doing here? And I was so miserable, so stressed just because of the nature of the job. But not only was it a stressful job, I was completely in the wrong place. Like I was just bending myself to be someone that I wasn't. I was in a gray suit, in a gray chair, surrounded by middle-aged men, which is fine for some people, the people who like love maths and financing technology and really analytical, like great, that would be amazing for someone. I, on the other hand, am creative, like the total opposite, like whimsical, spiritual. So it was just awful for me, but I just didn't know myself well enough at the time. And I'd just gone with what I thought I should do. I was driven by fear as well. Like I'd grown up really poor. So I was like, I just want to have money. Like I want to have stability. I want to be able to do what I want to do. I want to be able to travel and have nice things. It was all driven out of fear rather than my soul. But of course it was a wonderful gift because it led me down a path of alternative healing actually. Because when I had the diagnosis and we're like, okay, this is it. Then they prescribed me propranolol and amitriptyline indefinitely but like what was I going to do just take them forever like they, they weren't a cure they were helping the symptoms but they were never gonna get rid of it so I still had to do my job for a bit longer I couldn't just you know quit one day which I would never recommend like obviously make sensible decisions so I had to save up a certain amount of money before I could leave so I started to be there for a few more months and as I was still there, I then started venturing into alternative healing. So that really got me into spirituality. I'd always been into it, but then I started exploring acupuncture, Reiki, crystals, did a third eye meditation. Um, so again, looking back perspective, I'm like, it was a, a wonderful gift. If I hadn't felt so incredibly ill, then I probably wouldn't have written Living in Tune because I know how awful it feels to be out of tune. And I put a bullet point list at the beginning of different symptoms. Of course, not everyone's going to have generalized anxiety disorder. You might just feel a bit icky. You might feel frustrated. You might be a bit snappy and angry. You might just have a sinking feeling in your stomach, like, oh, this isn't quite right. You know, when you're in a relationship with someone and you're like, 
this there's just I'm not getting lit up here like there's just something not right another one as well is I think if you can think of a better option sometimes like I think the feeling of total satisfaction is being like I'm exactly where I'm meant to be for example in a relationship you might be like my husband and my wife like there's no one else in the world I'd rather be with perfectly in tune whereas if you're in a relationship with someone and you're kind of looking around or you're thinking about your ex and you're thinking "Mm, you know maybe that was better then it's not totally in tune so I think that's another symptom as well they can be super subtle or incredibly severe when you're out of tune but essentially you're just not living your best life I was definitely out of tune in my last job I just recently um I work in education so at the end of every year we sign next year's contract and when that process came around I told my boss I wasn't signing which is unusual for me. I've really only had two jobs in my life, but I was so out of tune, all of the things that you're describing and also just feeling like I didn't fit in. Like my thoughts, my answers, my expectations were different from all of the people around me in that job because, and I don't think that it was education that was the wrong choice for me. It was that particular school was just not a good fit at all. And it was scary to announce that I wasn't coming back. And, but I felt so confident that that was the right decision for me, that it made the scariness okay, because I had faith that something else was coming. And that's kind of an exciting thing. And luckily it did. (laughs) So. Can you explain more about the difference between should have and soul, soul of? Uh, and especially the part about impulse versus intuition. I struggled with that part so much because I buy things that make my soul happy and I do it for a while and then they do end up in goodwill or, you know, getting sold to someone else. Um, but I was kind of thinking that might be building blocks towards another creative endeavor then leading to the next path. So what, how can you tell the difference between the two? Totally. This is such a hard question. And it's funny, I actually get asked it quite a bit. So I have a blog that I wrote in it, which I'll always like ping out to people because it's quite a common one I get. So an example of this is my stepfather is an alcoholic. He's been sober for coming up to two years, but he's always been addicted to things all his life. Incredibly impulsive. If you know addicts, impulsive, impulsive, impulsive. So if you are someone who is impulsive, it's then very hard to tell the difference between because you're getting an urge, a very strong, passionate urge. Then it's like, oh, that's my intuition. It's like, oh, no, that's that's an impulse. So it's very hard to distinguish. And it really depends on the person. I think what I do, and this is partly because my human design as well, I'm a... um, emotional I've gotten the word for it now but I have to basically ride the emotional wave so I always have to wait like a day or two before making any decision which is how I live my life so I live my life intuitively but I'll mull over it for a day or two so that gives me time to let the excitement go and that's how I know the difference between impulse and intuition so I'll be like oh take note of that but if I have time it's not something I have to do like that instant I will let it let it fizzle out for a day or two and if it's intuition I'll still be like yeah I know that's the thing if it's impulse I'll be like yeah nah or like change my mind because it's like in the moment it's like oh I need to do it now and there's like an urgency behind it a fear if it's something that's truly right for you you can probably wait a day or two like I said as long as it's I don't know I can't think of an example now but if it's not something that's going to be instantly gone then um then I think letting the emotion around it fizzle out is a good way to tell the difference and to know if something is truly going to be right for you or not. I think that is great advice. I find myself doing that sometimes. Like I've been, I don't know, this is like a silly example, but I need a new backpack. And instead of just like buying the first cute little backpack that I find, I want to be intentional about it. So I know that that's, it's something small, but it's something that I want. And I'm taking my time to make sure it's the right one. And I think that you can do that with a lot of life decisions, I guess. (laughs) Yeah, I do that too, but it's always been unconscious. Like 
I mean, I didn't consciously know that I was doing it to check my intuition or to let things right. sink in. I just always called it, um, I, I got to soak on that for a little bit. I got to let that soak in and then I'll know what to do. But I, I never really thought of it in that way. Yeah, it takes me. You inspire me to like add things to my Amazon cart and then just let them sit there for a minute before <laughs> a minute, yeah, a couple I, days. Otherwise, I, yeah. I do that all the time. Yeah. Sometimes I get messages from Amazon. Did you forget? Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I did forget it, I don't need it. So <laughs> that's true. Um, I've done that. I must confess, I don't do that very often, but sometimes I will do that. I'll say, I think I really want that. And I'll put it there and then I won't be on Amazon for a while. And I'll come back and you look at that thing. You're like, what on earth? Why? Was Why I did thinking? I need that? Yeah. 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 I've even had this as well where, so like some situations you don't have that option. So for example, if you're like renting a flat and it's super competitive and you have to be like, I'm taking it now, otherwise someone else is going to get it. So when I got a flat in Glastonbury, which is super competitive, I'd basically done that process, but beforehand. So I was constantly looking at the listing. I'd like done that kind of reversed order. So I'd spent loads of time looking at it, walking around on Google Street View and like really checking it out, walked around the area before the viewing. And I'd basically done all of that work beforehand so that when I went in, it, that was the final piece. And I was like, yeah, now I'm here. Okay, yeah, yeah, I'm taking it to the form like this is mine. So it's also preparing if there's a situation where you, you're not going to be able to wait afterwards, then you can do it beforehand and use that as the final like tick um, or not as well. That's another option. So do you have a favorite story, you like your own personal story about following your intuition? And then after that, what about one from your client? Oh, my goodness. Um I think my favorite one is one I put at the end of the book when I knew I was going to be published by Hay House and I yeah and I literally knew it and it made no sense and my husband and other people be like why don't why don't you just you know they keep rejecting you why don't you just you know try somewhere else there's other publishers (laughs) and I was like no no I know I'm going to be published with them because when I was flicking through a Wayne Dyer book and it went to the last page and it said, join the house family. And it was like, it just zoomed in. And it was just one of those spiritual experiences that you can't explain to anyone else. If anyone else had been in the room, they wouldn't have even see it happen. It was just like a, a moment of like, whoa, recognition, soul recognition. And then when I got my contract, eventually a few years later, the first words were welcome to the Hay House family. And I was like, oh, that was why. So yeah, it made no sense. Like I said, they kept hitting me back and I wasn't applying anywhere else, um, but I knew it would be them. And I was totally right. And I'm glad I stuck it out. That's my favorite uh, story with regards to following my, my intuition. And then I think one, the one that's coming to mind with my client is a client who was a therapist in London and she was burn the f out just like back to back back to back back to back back to back and she was actually working for a company at this point doing a few kind of of her own clients on the side trying to set up her own full-time coaching business and therapy business which is what we were working on and she was miserable in London the weather's miserable anyway the lifestyle just everything and then she had the intuitive nudge to go to Spain, to basically basically pack everything up, go to Spain. She asked me, she was like, what do you think? I pulled some tarot cards. I said, it's looking really good. I think you should do it. But I said, you need to ask the universe for a sign. Like you're being called in this way. I'm behind it. But like final confirmation, let's get a third thing. Because I always believe in third time lucky. Let's get a sign from the universe. That evening, she was walking through Hyde Park in London. She bumped into someone that she knew who was sitting on a bench and she was just, you know, talking to them, catching up, whatever. And they mentioned the word Spain. And she was like, oh, my God, voice note of me is like, I can't believe they mentioned Spain. And I was like, there we go. And then she went and she had the best time ever. And she was so much happier. Um, So I think that was my favorite story. Do you still want to live in California or have has? Yeah. Totally. So I'm traveling the world at the moment. So I went for three months earlier this year. I'm in England now for some weddings and I went to a festival last weekend. And then 
Uh, in two weeks, I'm going to Greece, Costa Rica, Tulum, back for Christmas. I think I'll then do like Australia and Asia. So yeah, I'm traveling the world at the moment, but definitely manifesting California at the end. Do you know what part of California? Southern, definitely. Yeah, I love LA, Santa Barbara area. Yeah, we just drove through California and Santa Barbara. I loved it. And so we're in this town that's, it's complete. I've never been there. So we're in a strange town staying in an Airbnb. And it is one of those times where it was, we got in late and we wanted to go get dinner and we walked. So we're walking around a strange town at night and felt totally safe and at home. Santa Mm. Barbara is really beautiful. It's the only t-shirt I bought was Santa Barbara. Wow. It's really magical. And what I loved was the cliffs walking in the evening. I also felt really safe as well. When we were walking in the evening, they twinkle because of all the houses in the cliffs. And it was dark with just like fairy lights over the cliffs. I'm getting goosebumps. It's really magical. Very special place. Yeah. It's beautiful. I agree. But it's very different from L.A. Is that the other place you mentioned? Those two places are very different. (laughs) So it's actually, again, the Hollywood Hills. So it's something about the hills with the buildings. I just really love. And I also got married in Sorrento, which is the same. The hills with the buildings. Yeah, really, really speaks to me. I, I love it. And I love the vantage point, having that view as well. And just the weather. I mean, I'm from England. I know bad weather. I just need those clear blue skies in my life yeah. every day. Depending where in LA you are, you might not have clear blue skies, but yeah, there's you, a uh, lot of different climates. It's really crazy. Yeah. My brother-in-law lived there for a while and it, it was very fun to visit. It's uh, very crowded, but it's very crowded. Yeah. Just say a uh, hop, skip and a jump to uh, Kauai if you come visit. I know I'm desperate to go to Hawaii desperate so we also noticed in california we drove maybe half an hour away from the coast and we were in a redwood forest and you would expect like a forest to be really cool it got up to 91 degrees when we left the redwood forest we went back to the coast and it was under 60 degrees just like traveling 45 minutes but somehow being close to that pacific ocean has such an an amazing impact uh, on the weather. It's crazy. That's interesting. I, I wonder if like, maybe it is, was the forest dense? I wonder if it like holds heat in or like once it like kind of like water in a quarry, the longer the weather stays warm, the deeper the warm water goes kind of thing. Yeah. I don't know. I, I know the people there that I talked to said, if you go inland, it heats up pretty fast. And then if you go back to the coast, it gets really cool again. So I think it has more to do with the coolness of the Pacific Ocean. That's interesting. I don't think it was because we were in the forest. I think it was because we were inland. Inland, gotcha. Yeah. That makes sense. So I'm curious from everybody if they've ever, because signs were brought up in the book a few times. Has anybody seen like just a sign from the universe and known like that, that was something for you? I can't actually think of a time that I've seen a sign. I, when I was pregnant with Brandon, though, I had a dream, a very vivid dream that told me that I should keep him and rather than give up for adoption. So I guess that's a sign from the universe, right? In dream form. I'd say so. I'm trying to think if I've had a sign, um, but there are definitely times that I've just absolutely known this is the direction that I have to go. I I think the thing that trips me up sometimes is I feel like the universe teaches us lessons sometimes. And so I'm always like, am I headed in the wrong direction? And that's why this is so difficult. Or am I being taught a really important lesson right now? And that's why this is difficult. That's, Mm. That's probably the most challenging thing for me to differentiate. Yeah, I can't say that I've I, I, I mean, I don't know, maybe I wouldn't know a, a real sign if it hit me in the face. I just sometimes know when something feels like it's the right thing or not. But, you know, I mean, I keep bringing this up and it seems silly that I do it, but doing something that you normally wouldn't do, but you feel like you really needed to do it. I think that's something unusual. 
I don't know if that's a sign. I, I mean, I have to admit, I'm not someone that talks in terms of signs and things like that, but that's certainly something. Tracy, like going to a boat renaming ceremony. Exactly. Tracy, or I saw one for someone. you. You did? Yeah, it was um, after your interview at Oak Hills. Do you remember now? Oh, that's right. Yeah, so my mom had recently died and um, my brother kept getting these emails and so did I. Both of us were getting these emails about coins. If you find coins places, it's uh, a message from a loved one who's passed on and we both were just finding coins in all of these weird places. And then after we started finding the coins, we got those emails, both of us did. And so when Bill mentioned it to me, it really kind of freaked me out, but he got the same email and was also noticing all the coins. Anyway, I went in, um, I was new at teaching and um, the place that hired me to be a long-term sub, I really loved. And they had been very good to me. They came to my mom's funeral. I, I, it was really a good feeling. And then I interviewed for this other place who reached out to me. And when I, they offered me a job then and there, and I was like, oh, what do I do? I, I don't know which way to go. And I looked down and like, these are my feet, right between my feet, there was a penny on the on the sidewalk there at Oak Hills. And so I just smiled, I picked up the penny, I walked back in and accepted the job. And I'm really glad that I did. And that's how I met her. What? That's why we're best friends now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I forgot about that. I feel like my sign was not a happy one like everybody else's. Like reading the book, it unlocked a memory that I had kind of suppressed because she talked about um, feathers as signs. And I had just found out I was pregnant with my second child and I uh, went into what would have been the baby room and there was a broken blue jay feather in that room and blue jays represent my grandfather who's passed on. So I was like, oh, he's looking out for us. And I didn't take the broken part to mean anything. God, I'm going to tear up. But I ended up losing the baby a couple of days later. So I looked at it as, you know maybe the baby is with him now or yeah, it was a little bit of comfort in a really hard time. And like, how did a blue Jay feather end up in my house to begin with? And in that room of all places, that's usually shut, but um, wow. that, that was definitely a sign that really stuck out to me after reading that book. Do you have any signs Liz that like with feathers or anything? Cause that was brought up a few times. Mm. Oh my goodness. Yeah. The best one was at my wedding. Um, and it actually wasn't for me. It's my husband because my husband is an engineer, totally the opposite of me. I'm like wearing him down, but he's, you know, always cynical first, <laughs> analytical first. So we're like total opposites. Um, so for years I'd been asking and both of his grandparents had recently died a few months beforehand. So I'd been asking, I was like, please give him a sign. Like just, he needs evidence. He needs evidence to like connect with things. And he didn't have any, whereas I get evidence all the time, you know, signs and things like that. And so I've been praying and praying, please give him something. Like, I just want us to be able to connect on this. And then on our wedding day, we left our dinner and it was me, him, our videographer and our photographer. We got married in Sorrento on the coast. So we went out and we were on these kind of big boulders on the water. I was in my dress kind of clambering over to get some photos. And as we were out on this water, this enormous white feather floated down and he put his hand out and it just landed. Plop, and both the photographer and videographer dropped their cameras. We went... <gasps> And he just put his head on my shoulder and started sobbing, like crying his eyes out immediately because he knew what it was. It was from his grandparents that had passed. And then he had it in his uh, in his pocket for the whole rest of the day. And he was like so proud of it and so happy. And I was so happy because my prayers have been answered and we've got it framed ever since. But it was an enormous white feather because, you know, usually you just get kind of little ones. This was a full sized, massive white feather. 
nothing above us we were out on the open water like nothing had flown past and it just landed in his hand and it was so nice that it was the four of us there because the shock on their faces as they dropped the camera and the videographer was going I got it I got it on video I got it on video um, wow. so, yeah it was amazing so we have a picture of us looking up to the sky in like total shock and he's holding it in his hand so that was my favorite one that's mm. awesome yeah. Yeah. Really cool. All these stories are giving me chills. I love I know. it. <laughs> <Same>. <laughs> oh gosh. Liz, can you describe what happens when you unlock your tuition? Life fits you so much better. You really connect with your own power. You need less approval from other people. You understand the wisdom in your body. And I think you connect with yourself more deeply than ever before. You know how to guide yourself forwards. You're confused a lot less and for much shorter periods of time. And I think you trust yourself. You trust yourself so much more. You're less likely to get led astray or to give your power away to other people. And, uh, and I think you end up living your most fulfilling, abundant life. That sounds amazing. I, yeah, I love the story. And I got goosebumps reading the book when you landed on your public, you knew that was going to be your publisher. How did you stay centered? And how did you stop yourself from just throwing in the towel? Yeah, I, I, you mentioned a towel earlier and I talk about towel moments in the book where you're like almost about to throw in the towel. And it's so hard because someone earlier was talking about tests and it's like just because you're spiritual and you work with the universe doesn't mean that it's like all straightforward sometimes. Like, you know, we're still humans. You still have things to learn. Um, so, yeah, what do you do in those moments? It's still really hard. You still have to keep going. But I've had enough evidence now of the times that I have had those signs or followed my intuition and it's always worked out the way I thought that evidence is strong enough for me to know that it's just a timing issue. Like I've got it with California now. I swear I'm getting all the signs. I know it's going to happen. I just don't know the timing of it. But what I do know is that the timing always ends up being perfect and more perfect than I thought at the time. So I, I just have a lot of trust and a lot of faith and uh, just try and enjoy the ride in the meantime and take the lesson that you need to take from it because, yeah, things aren't always going to be straightforward. Life is life, unfortunately. Yeah. So what is next for Liz? Do you have any projects coming up that you can talk about? Totally. So I... I've got another round of my three month group coaching program, Spiritual Coaching Academy coming up. I love that program. That's a lot of people who have like read the book and then kind of want to continue. I also have another round of my book program for aspiring authors. I'm going to start a proposal for my second book as well. Um, hand that into Hay House at some point. So yeah, just continuing to grow, build, get people stepping into their full power and living really aligned, happy, abundant lives. That's awesome. Well, we want to leave our challenge or our listeners, sorry, with a challenge this week to spend some time with your present self, being thankful for all that you have. You know me, I like a good gratitude challenge. So start a good, start a gratitude journal, list three things every day that you're thankful for. And over the course of a week, try to notice if your, if your perspective shifts into a more positive direction, and then tell us about that using the hashtag siren soapbox on all the social medias. Liz, thank you so much for writing this book and for coming on our show today. Do you want to tell our listeners where they can find you? Of course. So the book is called Living in Tune, 21 Questions to Activate Your Intuition and Find Your Life Purpose. And I'm Liz Roberta, mainly on Instagram at I am Liz Roberta. My website is lizroberta.com. I've also recently started a vlog on YouTube. But yeah, best to start on Instagram, I think. And then everything else is linked there. Great. Sirens, thank you for being such an integral part of my life. I love sharing these moments with you each week. 
So thank you for that. And thank you, fellow explorers, for listening to this episode. Check out our website where we'll post links to Liz's book and her social media page, her Instagram page. You can also submit a challenge to us for a chance to be on the show or check out what fun adventure we're up to next. I'm personally looking forward to our upcoming episode on foraging. You can check all of that out at www.sirensoapbox.com. And until next time, dive in, stay curious, and be happy. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Siren Soapbox. And a special thank you to Sea Strings for providing our music. Snag your latest CP from iTunes today. Follow the Sirens on all the social medias and don't forget to tell your friends about us. Like and subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts. We'll catch you next time on another episode of Siren Soapbox.